Hi, welcome to the second installment of the Crooks Radiometer. Uh, I've made this video for two reasons. One, um, I've already found out that somebody already made the measurements of the Crooks Radiometer in a bell glass jar with different varying levels of vac uh, uh, vacuum. And it's very telling because the Crooks Radiometer does not work in a complete vacuum, which means that Ken Wheeler's idea isn't correct. Uh, and what that was, was he was saying it was the photoelectric effect, which basically lights are, are f causing electrons to, to emit from the black side, causing propulsion. But then, you know, there was another commenter who made a very fair statement, who said, well, okay, if that were true, something would have to replace the electrons in order for it to continue. In other words, you'd need a supply. And that's exactly how the photoelectric effect works. In the photoelectric effect, you basically have two electric, electrical plates, we have one uh, set to a very, very negative voltage, which causes electrons not to want to be there. And as light strikes this plate, it knocks them off into the positively charged plate. So for the photoelectric effect, we would actually need a voltage differential and a supply of electrons to keep this supplied with electrons. Otherwise, they would work for the first instant and then shut off because then there'd be no more electrons to fly off. Okay, so that part, it being the photoelectric effect, is now debunked. That is not the answer. Okay, the part about it working with blue light is still, still very, very prescient in this whole thing. Uh, I'm, I'm going to run the experiment again, and what I've done is I've taken my light meter, and I'm going to show that video r r real soon, and we're going to measure the actual, because one of the other commenters said, is, well, perhaps your filters have different varying levels of light, and perhaps, you know, the red light has least light, and the blue filter lets the most through. Let's go run that experiment right now. Okay, what I have now is the flashlight that we used, mounted a couple feet away, uh, mounted and pointing at the sensor. The reason why I have to mount it a couple feet away is because the flashlight is much, much more powerful than this meter can handle. And so the farther away, it makes it lower intensity and easier to, on the meter. So right now we got about 1667, 1668. And let's go for the red. We're about 50.2, green, five oh six, and the blue. Okay, it's about 92. I mean, the flashlight's probably winding down, so let's see, go back to. Yeah, so the flashlight is, is, is slowly dying on us. That's why it's, it was 1667 before, now it's 1613. So, but I mean, you got the general scale of how much energy is getting through the, fla the, the filters. There still is more energy coming from blue than red but a lot less energy than from green. And as you recall, oh, we don't have to make you recall nothing. Yeah, with the green, it's not even turning. Okay, now if I use the blue, you can see it's starting to accelerate. The flashlight's much, much weaker than it was before. It's actually run down from all the little testing I've been doing. So you see with the blue, it's actually moving. And you know the blue energy coming through, according to the meter, is about one-tenth the energy coming through on the green. And let me let it stop. And we'll put the green on. It's hardly, it's not even going to move. Flashlight's too weak. Again, going back to blue. All the dust on my blue filter. All right, and I know for a fact because it fast lights so weak. Let me let it come to a stop.
Okay, so it's the blue filter. It's the blue filter. That only high frequency light makes this thing move. Okay, so we've done the light meter test of the light source and the filters. And it's very clear that the overwhelming majority of luminous energy is through the green filter. And about a tenth of that is through the blue filter. And about a tenth of it, approximately, through the red filter. So you would think that the green filter would be the best if it was just luminous energy. It's not. It's also a function of frequency. That is one thing that Ken, only Ken Wheeler has ever done, but he just, you know, just assumed it was a photoelectric effect. But there's other things in science where you have a very, very high vacuum, not a perfect vacuum, but a very, very low air density, and where you have things that are reacting with the higher spectrum, actually the blue spectrum of light. And we can actually see this in the upper atmosphere, where ozone is created. Okay, now the problem I have with all the explanations, the other explanations require thermal, you know. So, okay, but let's come back to the ozone thing in a little bit. Let's go back and look at the other, the other explanations say there's something thermal going on. Well, I tried using my thermal imaging camera here to, you know, look at by shining light on it and looking at it with my thermal imaging camera. The problem with the thermal imaging cameras is that glass reflects the thermal energy. Okay, so if I can't see into this, because all I can see when I, sh when I shine my, my thermal imaging camera at this, even when I got lights on or whatnot, all I see is a thermal reflection of me, like this is a, a circular mirror. Okay, and so that gets into another problem, that thermal long wave radiation does not actually get into this damn thing. So even if you could say it's thermal energy from the flashlight, well, thermal energy is being reflected by the glass according to the thermal imaging camera. So I don't know how we can make any claim or measurement that there's something thermal going on. Maybe the blue light is absorbed by the black and then thermal, thermal is happening inside. Okay, without a means to go in there and actually uh, you know, in other words, what we'd have to do is go get ourselves a, a, a bell jar with a vacuum and actually build a thermal imaging camera inside the bell jar so we could watch it in the vacuum, not through the glass. Okay, so that experiment we may do if we can't come up with any other explanation. But right now, the one that's the most intriguing is what I mentioned before, has something to do with ozone creation. Because ozone is created in the very low vacuum, or sorry, very high vacuum, very low concentration of air and high frequency of light and that's why the upper atmosphere has that blue glow it's almost like an iridescent blue and we know that that blue isn't happening all throughout the atmosphere that blue is only happening up in the upper atmosphere where the air is where the air is thin if we're happening all throughout the atmosphere then the clouds should have a blue tinge and they don't so the blue glow we get from the sky is happening above the clouds in the upper atmosphere where the air is thin and where the air is thin, that's where it's easier for high frequency light to dissociate the oxygen molecule than to create ozone. Okay, so, um, and the other issue that was brought to light by the video that I mentioned before is that the concentration of oxygen in here is such that there's one molecule of air for every cubic centimeter. And it's ironic, the guy said, that these little veins are exactly one centimeter on a side. Is that coincidence? Who knows? Um, that's something that needs to be investigated. Uh, right now we're going to put this on hold because this looks like it's ionic propulsion. It looks like we're actually has ozone has something to do with it because if it were anything else, air wouldn't be a factor. If air is a factor and it's air at a high vacuum and it's more responsive to blue light, then it's highly logical that ozone has something to do with it or the dissociation of oxygen molecules. Okay, what we really should do in, the, in, in some later experiments is get a vacuum jar and put only oxygen in it, another one put only carbon dioxide in, another one only put nitrogen in it and see if it works better. But right now, as far as ethereal mechanics go, this is a very low priority experiment. So we're going to put this on hold. We're going to leave it as one of those things we'll come back to uh, because we have bigger fish to fry in the immediate uh, term.